and welcome to the Sunday School Hour here at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. Hymn number 476 is going to be our introductory Sunday School song. Let's sing the first verse standing together. It is glory just to walk with him. 476. It is glory just to walk with him whose blood has ransomed me. It is rapture for my soul each day. Taj Main, Taj Grant, what's up, buddy? I have sound. I don't know. I hope you do now. Taj, call me. I don't have your number. All right. Let me see if I can. All right. Well, we're gonna try to forget the sound today. I'll just move closer to the camera. Then that'll work for me. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. 1 Samuel 9, 2. And uh, 
I should probably turn there myself, since I just closed my Bible on it. 1 Samuel 9, chapter 2. Well, not 2 Samuel, because that's dealing with David. 1 Samuel 9, 2. We see, and the, well, I'll start in verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechoroth, the son of Athaiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. Lord, help us to remember you. Help us, Lord, to follow you and follow your precepts and the, to emulate our lives after you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Nobody is an island unto themselves. Everybody has influence. The good we do influences others for good. The wrong we do influences others for evil. And whether we like it or not, that's the way it is. Everybody has influence. If everybody has influence, everybody, to some degree or another, is a leader. True or false? True. Influence means leadership. Because your influence, even if it's not a giant influence, will be leading others. Right, Brother Andrew? Sure. Brother Andrew's agreeing with me. So in this first step, we are going to look at a negative influence. So this would be how not to lead, things that leaders should not be doing. Now, despite this here, one of the things about this negative influence, if we're looking at King Saul, this is before Saul became king, how was Saul described? Goodly. Goodly. And not just goodly, but it says there was... Now think about this from modern grammar. There was not a goodlier person than him. That's not. There's not a gooder person than King Saul for the way he looked. So if there's any grammar teachers out there, I'm sure that one's uh, just it's boiling you in the skin. It's like a betterist. Okay, so old grammar going on there. So King Saul was goodlier, and he was goodlier than everybody else. But what does it say about his physical description? He was tall. He was tall. I live in Miami. I'm now teaching in Miami. My favorite thing about teaching school in Miami is I am taller than every one of my students. Okay, and I have only, when I've taught in Miami, I've only had maybe three students that have been taller than me. So I'm there, I'm taller than them. It's, I'm six feet tall, so I'm not huge. But by comparison, I am, taller than everybody there. Most of my students, I'm able to look down and see the top of their heads. That's just the way it is. And if they're the girls, most of the girls will go to about my shoulder height. They will try to wear heels or whatever as much as they can get away with for their school uniforms. But by comparison, I am a giant in Miami. Now, everywhere else I've taught, that has not been the case. But in Miami, I am taller than the other people that are around me. So I like that physical side there of being tall. Well, Saul, he wasn't just a giant by Miami standards. He was a head and shoulder taller than the people that were around him. So he was tall. He was good looking. He had the physical characteristics that you would look at for a king, wouldn't you? If you have a king, you would want the king to be someone you could look up to. And he could be physically looked up to because of his height. He would also say, well, he's got the determination. He's got the goodly countenance, the goodly appearance. Saul had the physical qualifications that you'd look at for a leader. Well, God anointed him to be king. God anointed him to be the first king of Israel. Was Saul the first man that tried to be king of Israel? No. There was others that tried to be king of Israel beforehand. What happened to them? Yes. Okay. Well, they died. It said that a woman threw a millstone down from a tower and killed him. So there was others that tried to be king before him, but Saul was the first one that was chosen with God's blessing. God chose Saul to be king. Now, the children of Israel did wrong when they picked a king. Yes, they did. And when they picked a the king, they left God's blessing. But 
when God knew that they would leave God's blessing, he put in words in Deuteronomy telling them this is what you will do when you do choose a king. And he said in Deuteronomy that you're not supposed to choose a king. But Saul had a physical qualifications. And it, he was chosen by God. Anointed by Samuel the prophet. And that's in the end of verse 10. Let's look more some of what were the characteristics of Saul though. Go to chapter 11, verse 4. Chapter 11, this is when Saul, very early being king, very early, right away as he's king there, we see his first hardship that comes up here. 1 Samuel 11, 4. And Brother Andrew, can you read that for us? Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Uh, sorry, can you read all the way to verse 7? Sure. And behold... Saul came after the herd out of the field, and Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. And he took a yoke of oxen, and hewed them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. Okay, so this is, we see the first trial that has come to King Saul. Right away, he's king. They chose him to be king because they were having problems. Now, if, let's take a side note on this. If the judges were doing what the judges were supposed to do, would the children of Israel wanted a king? No. 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 Okay. Now, with the judges doing what they were supposed to do, we even have some judges that did right, and immediately after them, they had problems that came there. Samuel did right. If you look in the Bible, will you see a reference to Samuel having sin in the Bible? No, but if you look at Samuel's sons, what's the Bible say about Samuel's sons? They didn't it, do right. They didn't do right. They didn't follow after their father. The same as Eli. Eli with his sons didn't follow after him. Although the Bible does record that Eli was rebuked for not removing his sons. So Samuel did right. His sons didn't do right. We have others that temporarily did a great job. And then they got caught up with other things, such as Gideon. So... There were some judges that if they were doing what they were supposed to have done, we wouldn't have had the king. But we're looking at the leadership here. We're looking at this first characteristic. And the first thing I see is he cared about what the people said. Because he went out, and the first thing we saw when Saul was doing right, he saw the people that were crying. So he asked why. So he wasn't oblivious to the people's needs. But then the next thing we saw is he moved decisively. And when he moved decisively, he moved decisively in verse 6. It says, in the spirit of who came upon him. Okay? So in the beginning, when Saul was doing things, he wasn't doing things in his power. He wasn't doing things in the might of King Saul. He was doing things, he was making decisive action as a leader should. A leader should make decisive action. But he was making his decisive action, caring for the people, being responsible for the charge that was set under him in the spirit of God. If you're going to be an effective leader, an effective Christian leader, you need to be empowered by the spirit of God. We will see what happens to Saul afterwards when he's no longer empowered by the spirit of God. Well, let's look down at the end of this same chapter. At the end of this same chapter, we see, uh, where is it? Verse 12, and the people said unto Samuel, who is it that said, Saul shall, shall, sorry, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that they may be put to death. And Saul said, there shall not a man be put to death this day. For today, the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. So right away, after his first battle, his first victory, the people said, whoever said Saul's not going to be king over us, let's kill him. 
Saul graciously, still in the spirit of the Lord, says, no, we're not killing anybody today. He's unifying the people. He's bringing them together. This is a banner moment. At this time here, he said, everybody's coming. We're all fighting together. Because there was a problem in Jabesh. And the problem in Jabesh is people were going to be killed. And the people said, how about we surrender to you? And they said, sure, you can surrender to us. We'll rip out one of your eyes. We'll hobble you. We'll do all kinds of horrible stuff to you. Because just to make a laughing stock of you. And they said, well, this is a horrible thing. Give us three days to think. And then the Ammonites said, okay, we'll give you time. Well, Saul responded. And Saul saved Jabesh. And there was a special relation between Jabesh there and Saul afterwards for years to come. So this one, though, was a banner moment. This was a everybody unified together. A true leader, an effective leader, will unify people. So we've seen right away, we've seen the physical characteristics. They didn't matter, but Saul did have his physical characteristics. We saw, first of all, he was caring for the people. He took decisive action. He unified the people. And then at the end, he forgave those that spoke against him. Do we forgive those that speak against us? Is it easy? We should. No. Okay. So, Brother Andrew, when was the last time somebody spoke evil against you? It probably happened behind my back. Okay. (laughs) Probably didn't even know about it. Okay. So, let's call on somebody else. Stacy. You would be the student in class that would never raise your hand and never be called on. But since from my years of teaching, those were my favorite students to call. Has anybody ever spoken evil about you? Gossip. Okay, is it fun to hear about it? No. Do you really like when you hear about it? Is it fun to have to forgive that person? No. Okay. How about this one? They didn't even speak evil about him behind his back they said it right in front of everybody else and they said in front of king saul this person's not going to be king over us who is this man saul forgave them though speaking behind the backs one thing but this was an open this is an open like who are you an open rebellious attitude an open rebellious spirit but saul forgave that consequence now this is the last time We're going to see great things coming from him. This same Saul, he had that spirit because if we look back at, let's go to chapter 10, verse 22. Chapter 10, 22, they're looking for Saul to make him king. And where does it say they found Saul? They couldn't find him. He was hiding. So chapter 10, verse 22, and uh, chapter 10, verse 22, it says, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further. If the man should yet come thither, and the Lord answered, Behold, he had hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upwards. And Samuel said to the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen. There is none like him among the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. So he's hiding his humble roots. He was so humble at the beginning He did not choose himself to be king. He was told he's going to be king, and he's hiding among the stuff. Now, if he's hiding among the stuff at his father's house, it makes me wonder, how much stuff did his father have? Was his father a hoarder? So, if you're hiding among the stuff, that means there's a lot of stuff. Maybe he's in a closet. They didn't really have closets the way we have closets. Or was he a terrible landscaper? Okay. Or was there stuff everywhere out in the yard? It's a terrible landscaper hiding among the stuff. But we have a humble background, a humble rising from a goodly person, a humble rising with a goodly person who unified everybody together. He forgave his enemies. And all of this happened because he moved in the spirit of the Lord. Sadly, that doesn't last with King Saul. That is why Saul was chosen to be king. God chose him for a time and for a purpose. Did Saul do as he was chosen for? For a time. For a very short time. But real quick, we see the falling apart of King Saul. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And this is where the negative side will come. You will very rarely find somebody that does everything right in front of everybody. 
there are some people that you will not catch them doing wrong. They, they will live such an outstanding life in public or what you will see of them, you will not see them in sin. Now, that does not mean that they have lived a life without sin. But there are some that they have such a good public image, they take care of their, they take care of their walk, they take care of their testimony. They walk with such fever before the Lord to make sure that they're following his statutes that you looking from the outside may not be able to perceive sin. Now, much more often, there's people that are on the other side that you will look at them and you will have a very hard time to catch them doing right. After this time out, it is hard to catch Saul doing right because of all the problems he had. He started so good and then he just, it's like a light switch flip and it became so bad. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that who had smitten a garrison of the Philistines? So. Who's it say smote the garrison, the garrison of the Philistines? So. So. But who did it say right before that actually smote the garrison? Jonathan. Okay, so Jonathan smites the garrison. Who's claiming the credit? Saul. So. Okay, and how long has Saul been reigning now? Two. Two years. So two years. Is two years a long time? Nope. Okay, two years is very fast. Two years flies by. And in two years' time, he went from being that man that unified Israel and had forgiven his enemies to now uh, being lifted with pride. So much pride that he had to... He's, he's his own cheerleader. He's tooting his own horn. And he's claiming credit as if he did something. Did Saul actually do this, though? So? No. No. Who did it? Jonathan. Okay. So already we're seeing character flaws starting to arise. That first victory, it got to his head. And from the first victory, he wanted another one. Two years had passed. There hadn't been a major banner victory. There was still war between him and the Philistines. And now, at this time, he is claiming it. He won't let his son claim it. He won't say, Jonathan smote the Philistines. It has to be, it won't be the Lord smote the Philistines, as you'd see that David would have said. It has to be, I smote the Philistines. So, in two years' time, the problem has arisen. Well, from this problem that arose here, we see problems happen. And in the problems that happen here in 1 Samuel chapter 13, we see that Saul becomes impatient. And it, with Saul's impatience here, with his pride, it gets signified worse than this one in verse number 9. It says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering. And he, this is Saul, offered the burnt offering. Who was supposed to offer burnt offerings? Priests. Okay. Why were the priests supposed to offer the burnt offerings? It was their job. Okay, it was their job. We're in the we're looking at this. This is the Old Testament time. In the Old Testament time, were the people able to go directly to God with intercession? No. no. Their prayers could. And God encouraged people to pray directly to him. And there was people that said, in this time, men sought after the Lord. But to offer the sacrifices, sacrifices had to be made. And sacrifices had to be made by the office of the priest. The priest had to make the sacrifice. And this time here, who is making the sacrifice? Okay, so Saul is making the sacrifice. Later on, we're able to see that if we search in the scriptures, the Bible says that there would be the office of a prophet, a priest and a king. Now, 
In a previous reference, it does say that Saul was numbered among the prophets because God did use him to prophesy, although whatever he prophesied was not recorded down in Scripture. Was Saul declared to be a king? Yes. But was Saul declared to be the prophet, priest, and king? Who is our prophet, priest, and king? Jesus. Who's the only one that was declared to be the prophet, priest, and king? Jesus. As the only one, and he was declared to be a priest after the order of Mount Melchizedek, which came before the order of Aaron. So, because Jesus is before Aaron. But Saul's lifting himself up. Well, how many of you have ever done something wrong, and as soon as you did something wrong, your parents or the supervisor was right around the corner and walked in there? Oh, that's a lot. Okay. Uh, has that ever happened to you at work, Andrew? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So what happened to you at work? You're smiling like you, like the Cheshire cat that just ate a canary, so let's hear your story. Like the kid, like the kid in the, with the hand caught in the cookie jar? Yep. Well... To make a make a short story short, or a long story short, I guess in this case, I did something that I wasn't supposed to do. Okay, and you got caught. And I got caught. Well, that's not exactly what we were asking for. I was looking for an example. So, <laughs> if the most recent one, a few years back, I was teaching a lesson, or I was supposed to be teaching a lesson, and uh, we got way sidetracked off of this lesson. And when I say way sidetracked, we were talking about politics and uh, <laughs> we were talking about all kinds of things and how the environment wasn't and how people were trying to force the environment into their political agenda for something because a hurricane had come through. So we were way off track. So the lesson for the day was supposed to be on the quadratic equation doing the parabolas there. So. That was what my lesson for the day was supposed to be on. And we were way off track. I had a, I had information written on the board as we were going through it. We were having a great class discussion. So they were learning, but it had absolutely nothing to do with what they were supposed to be learning. And so as I'm in the middle of this, lo and behold, in walks in the, it's my supervisor. It wasn't the principal. It was, what was Mr. McGahey's position? The guidance counselor. So he's walk, He's also the dean of students, though, because he'd also do the student discipline. So he was a guidance counselor and dean of students. So he walks in. And so as he's walking in there, all of a sudden, I've got everything up here. And right away, I'm trying to go, and I try to see. I'm going to try to change it back to where I need it to be. And as I'm caught, I instantly I flip the switch to try to go to teaching about parabolas. And I'm holding it in. I'm almost wanting to laugh. The students are looking. Uh, some of the students are trying to pull out pieces of paper, trying to open them up. So Everybody's trying to cover it up. Just, yes, he's just sitting back and he's waiting. He said his spiel and now he's waiting to make us miserable because he knows he's caught us there. And then he says, so what were you talking about? And then everybody laughs. And some of the students, they tried to pull it off like nothing. But I said, no, we were talking about the environment and how it didn't come to play he says I knew it and then he left so it was okay I didn't get in any trouble afterwards but it was one where I was caught completely off task so it happens and the Bible says be sure your sin will find you out so I did make sure after that to try to stay much more on task and uh, I did a good job teaching those students and most of those students were able to move on towards dual enrollment on the math side. They tried to do dual enrollment. That was a big push at that school. And before I was there, they weren't able to do it because their math skills weren't good enough. Afterwards, it was more their English problem for not getting dual enrollment. So I was happy about that. So, but moving on, Saul was caught. And Saul wasn't just caught doing some minor problem there about talking how the environment would be forced for politics instead of going directly into a lesson on a Friday afternoon. Saul was taught directly disobeying the Lord. Right before this, it said that Samuel was coming. So now we see Saul being impatient. He was proud. He was impatient. And with his pride and his impatience, Samuel says, "What in verse 11, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, 
And if thou camest not within the days appointed, and the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. So he forces himself. He says, You're not here. He's blaming Saul because of this. He says, Because you weren't here, so I couldn't go and I couldn't make supplication to the Lord because it's your fault. So he's now blaming others for his shortcomings. The person that was supposed to be there to offer the sacrifice because Samuel was a priest. He says, Because you're not here, your fault. Well, Samuel didn't have anything for it. God didn't have anything for it. This is the first point where Saul was rejected. So Saul's rejected. He receives his bad news. Well, his first major problem that came there. After he receives his bad news, after his now rejection, chapter 14. In chapter 14, we get the comparison. And in the great comparison that happens here, we have Jonathan, his son, goes up, and Jonathan, his son, delivers Israel. Again, Israel is delivered by the hand of his son. But before this one, we have the dire picture of what's happening with King Saul. In this dire picture of what's happening with King Saul, we have, in the previous chapter, chapter 11, we saw he gathered the army together. When they numbered the army that he gathered together, he had almost 400,000 men. In chapter 13, and Samuel arose and got him from Gilgal. He left, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, that were with him, were present. They abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And it said a number here. It's 600. I forgot which exact verse it was, but it was a number of where it was 600 people. Saul's, it's which one? Verse 15. Verse 15. Okay. So Saul's influence, because he wasn't doing what was right, because he wasn't moving in the power of the Lord, he had fallen only to 600 people. Yes, he sent some of them away, but instead of having all of Israel gathered together when he was doing things in the Lord's might, now it was doing things in his might, everything's falling apart. And in his might, if we look a little bit later, he gets depressed, he gets moody, sitting in his own side, having a pity party because he's rejected by Samuel and rejected by the Lord, he sits under a pomegranate tree. And if not for Jonathan, his son, following after the Lord, we would have had the end of King Saul right here. If not for Jonathan following after the Lord, King Saul would have died at about the second year of his reign, and everything would have been different. So this would have been the end of him, except there was others that were there that were better than him. So... The problem with Saul, his pride, his offering. Well, go to chapter 14. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, after Jonathan has a victory, after Jonathan goes and leads the people up, because Jonathan, instead of doing things in his might, he did things as Saul had done earlier in the power of the Lord. Jonathan set a fleece before the Lord, and he went in the Lord's will. Well, at the end here of chapter 14, this is a long passage here, so I'm not going to read the entire section. We have Jonathan, he says, Draw hither all the, draw ye near hither all the chief of the people, and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be by Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among the people that answered him. So he has a plan. Saul gave an order. Because Saul was rash now, he gave an order and said, anybody that eats any food before the end of the day will be put to death. So they're going to battle. And not only are they going to battle because the king's now moody and depressed, the king isn't eating. And because he's moody and depressed, he's saying to his men, you're not going to eat. Well, Jonathan wasn't there when the order was given. And after this battle, Jonathan and the people, they ate the food. And they were so hungry that they said that they fell upon the cows and they were eating them still with their blood. So they were eating raw steak. I've never been that hungry to eat a raw steak. So uh, I don't even like steak when it is super rare. Rare is okay. I prefer medium rare. 
I know there are some people that they will get the grill as hot as they possibly can. They will sear the steak on the outside and then they'll flip it over so it'll be seared on both sides and then it'll be still cold in the middle with red blood running out. So maybe that is your style. I cannot eat steak that way. So rare is okay. I prefer medium rare. There's some people, however, that the steak is to be all the way well done. Okay, I do not like a well done steak because it is too dry. It becomes Game dry like a crisp. But enough with the steaks. In this one here, after this victory, and because of the sake of time, we'll have to move on. After this victory, Saul said, because Jonathan, you ate the food, you're going to die. So such short-sighted, with such a little sight there. Jonathan already delivered Israel twice at this point. At this point, Jonathan delivered Israel twice, and Saul says, you're going to die. The people then said, and the people saved Jonathan from Saul, and said, why are you going to kill whom the Lord hath brought this great deliverance from? From this point out, Jonathan lived another 38 years. And remember, everybody has influence, and we're not an island unto ourselves. Our influence affects others. From this point out, how many other great victories did Jonathan do for Israel? How many other times was he recorded in the Bible doing a great victory? Now, the Bible doesn't say everything that happened there, and I will take some conjecture here. After his father almost killed him at this last one, do you think his father's influence affected the spirit and the demeanor that Jonathan went out in after his father wanted to kill him the day of a great victory? Mm -hmm. From this time out, we didn't see Jonathan leading any great victories. When it does, we don't see Jonathan doing anything great with any great salvations for Israel. No victories, no nothing there. Jonathan more passes into the scenes. He's on the background. He's David's friend. Saul actually wants to kill Jonathan for being David's friend. So we have seen this collapse. And in chapter 15, we see the utter demise and the utter failing of King Saul. In chapter 15, the utter failing of King Saul, we see this one here. And uh, chapter 15, it's almost the entire chapter goes through it. In chapter 15, Saul was given this last order, this last chance by God, saying, go and destroy the Amalekites. History lesson, why did God want the Amalekites destroyed? Their iniquity had come full. Okay, well, what iniquity did the Amalekites do that God said, go and kill all of them? Because they were no good. They were no good. But the people, the Amalekites, when Israel was wandering in the wilderness, they attacked the back of the camp. They attacked the rear ones, the, the ones that were going there. Who is in the back of the camp? It's a group travels. Who's in the back on a long hike? Okay, the elders and the children. How many of you have ever done a long hike? If you do the long hike, the children will be in the back because they're tired. They've got short legs. And the elderly will be in the back. Why? Because they're slower. They don't have the strength. That is who the Amalekites attacked. They attacked and they killed the children of Israel and the elderly. Mm. If you're attacking the elderly and the children, are you uh, brave? No. no, not in the okay. least. So you're taking after the weak targets, the weak ones there. Because of that, there was a command to Saul to go and kill them, to utterly destroy them. Saul didn't do it. Saul went and he fought. And when Saul went and Saul fought, he took, the, he took all their spoil. He took their riches and everything, which was fine. But Saul was said, don't, in your destruction of them, kill everybody, man, woman, children, everything, even all their cattle. Saul took all the cattle, all the sheep, everything. And Saul took their king, and he took him captive. And he's going, and he's parading it, so he's got this great victory. Samuel has enough of it. And more importantly than Samuel having enough of it, God had enough. And God told Samuel, go in and confront him. So when Samuel went and confronted him, this is where we see that God says, 
that to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the blood of rams. Because in this time, when Samuel confronts Saul, again, at this time here, Saul blames other people for his problem. Saul again blames and says, well, the people made me save all these animals to offer a sacrifice. The people, so he's blame shifting here. It's not Saul's fault, now it's the people's fault. The people had to offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, your God, that he said to Samuel. So he blame shifts again. It's blame the people, and because the people had to sacrifice because of the Lord, your God. Is he leading now at this point? At this point, we've seen the complete desolation. The leaders completely unraveled all around him. And sadly, from this point out, everything goes a lot worse for Saul. He's, from this point out, when you see Saul later on, when Saul's talking about King David, Saul's going to be using manipulation. Has, is there any of you that follow after me? He's going to use guilt trip. Do any of you feel sorry for me? And then he's going to say, or are all of you in line accusing them of being with the house of Jesse and the son of David? Saul started off so good. He started so great. The head and shoulders taller, the goodlier than everybody else that was around him. He was humble. He followed the Lord. In the end, he was following his own will. In the end, he took of the spoil of the Amalekites. He didn't kill Agag. Who ended up killing Agag in Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15? John. Well, Samuel killed him. So Samuel kills Agag. Saul tries to kill Jonathan later on. Saul discourages Jonathan to the point where Jonathan was no longer going and leading great victories for Israel. How many times does Saul try to kill David with the javelin? Twice. Twice he tries to throw a javelin to try to spear David to the wall. And uh, there, I encourage you, read 1 Samuel 15. Look at it. Look and see what Saul did. Look at it for yourself there. For this time, we're just doing a survey of the characters, so we're not going in through all of them, and we're almost out of time. But we have a man that had such a promising start. Uh, he had just, he had this rise. It was like a shooting star. He was up there. But like a shooting star, he was gone so fast. All the good that he had done was gone. And then he just had 38 years of lingering death. 38 years of lingering on where he was rejected from being king and he held on to it. Because God told him, you're rejected. And when God told him, you're rejected from being king, what he should have done is said, I have sinned. But in the end of 1 Samuel chapter 15, he does say, I have sinned. But the whole reason he says, I have sinned, is that he says, Samuel, come and offer the sacrifice with me, that I may be accepted by the people. He didn't care anymore about the personal sin. He cared about the reception among the people. He cared, instead of caring for what God thought about his heart, he cared for, what does man think about me? He was rejected. And he was rejected because of the pride that he had there. So we're looking at a leader. Great leaders, they have a they unify everybody together. They're not divisive. Great leaders. And if you're going to be a biblically great leader, you are going to have the Spirit of the Lord on you. In the end, when Saul was dividing people apart, when Saul was throwing his pity party and wanted to kill his son Jonathan, was he moving in the Spirit of the Lord? So Saul, at the end, did everything he was not supposed to do. The sad thing of him. Such a promising start. Ruined. But there's lessons we can learn from it. I'm not a head and shoulders taller than everybody else, am I? And no, God hasn't chosen me to be king of Israel. But has God chosen me for a purpose and for a plan? Mm -hmm. And with the purpose and the plan, I am chosen to lead. I have a family I have to lead. I am chosen to lead. I have a classroom I have to lead. 
I am chosen, and each of us has a similar thing, where we either have a family, we have friends, we have others, God has chosen us to have influence over. And with the influence that we have, we are chosen to lead them into doing what is right, to encourage them when we see good, to not go and not to, we're not called to call out every single thing that somebody else does that is wrong. But when we have the chance, and if they ask, what do you think about something here? If they ask and they open it up, to honestly tell them what you're doing is wrong and it's going to hurt you. To honestly speak, to contend for the truth. Each of us has that calling. And with each of us having that calling there, there is a balance between being a busybody and between contending for the truth. And that's one pray to God that he will give us the wisdom for it. But all of us have a purpose. And all of us have a calling. And if King Saul, with all of his goodly appearance and his head and shoulders taller, if he could lose track of his purpose, so can we. So you saw as a warning. He started great. And he had the great best start ever. But then he fell apart. It was a train wreck that fell apart so long and so fast afterwards. The train wreck that fell apart that at the end of his life, he killed all the priests because he said the priests were conspiring against him to help David. And then because there was no more priests around that would go and offer sacrifices on his behalf, then he went and he chased after a lady with a familiar spirit, a necromancer, to call up the dead to go bring back Samuel to talk to him. That's how far Saul had fallen. Yeah. And Saul was somebody that intimately knew the Lord. That Saul was a believer that God had spoken directly with. And if Saul can fall that way, watch out. So can we. Do we have any questions or comments? All right. No questions or comments. Brother Dollins, can you close us in a word of prayer, please, sir? Dear Father, we thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to be humble in your sight, Lord, and uh, obey what you say. And Lord, when we do uh, sin, Father, against your commandments, help us to admit and confess them to you, Lord, that you're forgiveness, so that we can go on growing. Be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Church will start in about 15 minutes, as Brother Andrew says, with a fresh live stream.